Okay, so we have to talk about inductance, abbreviated L measured in Henry's, abbreviated H. We basically have resistance. We know what that is. We've introduced capacitance. But inductance is the last thing we want to introduce. And then the truth is all three of those actually affect current. And all three of them exist at all times, um, whether it's just a wire or a, a variety of components. <clears throat> So let's let's see if we can define <coughs> what the what inductance is. Inductance has to do with the interaction of magnetic fields and current. So it turns out when you have electrons on the move, they do generate a magnetic field. So moving electrons create a magnetic field. <coughs> but it works the other way too. Moving magnetic fields or relative motion between a magnetic field and a conductor. In other words, the conductor could be moving. <clears throat> but as long as there's motion between the two, uh, then you can generate current from that. So changing magnetic fields, moving magnetic fields, moving conductors within magnetic fields. If you have relative motion happening, the electrons in the conductor get pushed around by the varying magnetic field. So varying current creates a varying magnetic field. A steady current creates a steady magnetic field. Um, relative motion between magnetic fields and conductors creates current. So all those things are happening, <clears throat> and that's what we're going to look at. But the, uh, the ability of, of a magnetic field to induce current in a conductor, in other words, give those electrons a push. That ability is known as inductance. It means that the, the, the magnetic field can induce a current. So uh, that is a way to generate uh, electrical current. <clears throat> and it's in fact how generators do it. You know, when we looked at batteries, there's a chemical reaction that pushes, you know, uh, electrons to one side of the battery. And, strips them away from the other and uh, <clears throat> and that's how you generate the voltage that generates the current but with induction um, you actually use magnetic fields to push the electrons okay and maybe one final thing in the introduction here um, the induction uh, can come uh, sort of as an interplay all like within the same component, uh, call that self-induction. It could be cross-induction where one coil uses its magnetic field to induce current in another coil. That would be cross-induction. And that's actually a transformer. So we'll get to those later. But an inductor <clears throat> is simply using self-induction. Its own current going through itself creates its own magnetic field and its own magnetic field interacts with itself. Um, with in an inductive way. Now inductance happens even just with a piece of wire, um, but if you want to strengthen the effect, then you can coil the wire up. And that's typically what inductors are. They are a coil of wire made to have a specific amount of inductance. So that's a long introduction. Um, maybe we can show you the schematic symbol for an inductor. It is just a coil of wire okay meant to have a specific amount of inductance um, but like i said I, want, I don't want you to think that you have to have a coil to have a magnetic field it just strengthens the magnetic field and strength strengthens the inductive effect <clears throat> yeah okay um let's see if we can get to sort of how this all happens the little experiment that we're going to run <coughs> is to just put a little circuit together um, with an inductor in it and so we can draw that, I guess, and then we'll talk about it. And, you know, maybe we'll finish up by, by reviewing capacitance so that we can sort of compare and contrast the two because they are opposites in many ways. So if we want to see how an inductor behaves or how inductance behaves, right, because it can happen even just with anything, not just a specific inductor. But let's see if we can figure out how things are going to behave here. So, um, 
we can use a square wave because a square wave can um, sort of hit that inductor with voltage or no voltage and that'll let us see how it behaves um, how it responds how it reacts you know to changing voltage because that's really <clears throat> that's really the game here in the AC course um, how does resistance respond or react to changing voltage well it doesn't really have a reactance to it <clears throat> because it's it's pretty much going to be the same resistance no matter what but capacitors and inductors who have capacitance and have inductance that there there is reactance to changing voltage and so you know capacitor charges and discharges and an inductor we'll see what it does so let's get our square wave here and we can say uh let's see uh, we'll hit it with some high voltage and then we'll go to zero volts okay so that's going to be our our square wave that we're going to hit this thing with okay and actually you know what let's um Let's not make it so big. We'll draw a schematic version first. So here's our little square wave. And you can generate this square wave in the analog discovery. And let's subject our inductor to that square wave. Let's do one more thing. Let's put in a resistor because we can watch the voltage across that resistor and that will tell us what circuit current is doing right because ohm's law is straightforward <clears throat> in fact uh, in the experiment that we're going to do um, we're going to put a, a 1k resistor here and watch the voltage across it and of course whatever voltage we see across it that'll be the current that's running in the circuit in milliamps <coughs> okay well at the first instance voltage all of a sudden is applied to this simple series circuit current will attempt to flow and boy that's a key word attempt because what's going to happen is as soon as current tries to come through this inductor remember what we said about moving electrons they create a magnetic field so at first there's no current and then current's going to start to it's going to try to start but as current tries to start, think about it, it's increasing from zero. So what's going to happen is we're going to get an expanding magnetic field. Because current was zero and now it's all of a sudden trying to get going. And as current tries to get going through an inductor, a field expands outward, a magnetic field expands outward across the inductor itself. And that causes an induction within the coil itself. And the induced voltage or the push that comes from that expanding magnetic field as current tries to increase is actually a backwards voltage that's generated pushing um, back against the current that's trying to flow. <clears throat> So they would call this a back EMF or electromotive force is what that stands for. Or another word you'll hear associated with that is buck. So the inductor bucks the attempt at current to get going. Um, it can't help it. Uh, it it's, it's its own problem, right? The current that's trying to flow in fact does <clears throat> grow from zero to some amount of current but while it's growing the field's expanding and while the field's expanding you have relative motion across the inductor's own windings and that generates voltage and in fact it generates an opposing voltage that is the impedance that the inductor offers to the current it impedes the current not with resistance although we'll get to that the inductor does have some winding resistance you can't help it it's made out of wire that wire has a certain amount of resistance but <clears throat> the other type of impedance or the other way that the inductor impedes current is with this self-generated back emf from current as it tries to 
uh, start happening. <laughs> um, so it's bucked or uh, impeded. The current is by a by a reverse generate a voltage that's a reverse polarity generated voltage. Okay, so that's the initial reaction or reactance of the inductor to a changing voltage. It bucks it, it generates, self generates its own voltage, and it's a real voltage that's being generated um, that opposes it. Well, eventually the magnetic field uh, will keep expanding and, and getting farther away from the coils and um, slows down. And all that happens as current is increasing to sort of a steady state current. So this all equalizes, and at that point, <coughs> the magnetic field around the inductor is no longer moving. There's no longer any voltage, reverse voltage generated. And what you have is basically the inductor dropping out of the picture. It looks like a short. So at first, we'd have to say, if we want to characterize this, what could we say? The, the back EMF, really, um, the inductor looks like an open. You know, it won't allow current for that first instant. Um, or, you know, we could say it's an open, it's a sort of infinite ohms, isn't it? But then once we've reached a steady state, um, except for the winding resistance, which can be very small. I mean, it can approximate zero ohms if you use thick wire. In our case, the inductor we have, it's going to be about 100 ohms of winding resistance. So we will be stuck with that. But um, accepting the winding resistance, the inductor starts by looking like an open and finishes by looking like a short. You know, zero ohms. Again, I'm, that's with winding resistance that would be insignificant. <clears throat> like I said, we have 100 ohms, but not exactly insignificant. But So... Just to sort of map out the whole <coughs> reaction that's happening, the reactance of the inductor to a changing voltage is what we're trying to sort of show you here. So far it looked like an open, then now it looks like a short. When it gets to the steady state, the magnetic field stops expanding at some point. Uh, so so the, the back EMF is gone. We have a magnetic field, but if current's not changing, the field's just stationary. There's no relative motion. There's no back EMF. Um, <clears throat> so that all goes away. And we have a steady state current. And the current will just be determined by, um, you know, whatever voltage we have here, right, at the peak that we're applying. Because we're still at just the positive peak here. <clears throat> well, I'll just to demonstrate all this. That voltage divided by the 1K. Yes, we've got a little bit of the 100 and we'd have to wrap in there, but that's the current that'll be flowing and everything's fine. Uh, the field is stationary because if, if it's a steady current, it's a steady field, there's no relative motion, there's no generated voltage. <coughs> okay, so it looks like an open, then a short. Well, we're not done. There's one more big effect. When voltage goes to zero, Um, our inductor, well, what's going to happen? Let's see. We go to zero. So current is going to, <clears throat> uh, well, try to go to zero. And it's interesting that I have to say try. You would think, what do you mean? Voltage goes to zero, current goes to zero. With, with a simple resistive circuit, that's absolutely true. Um, nothing complicated about it. But again, we're in the AC course and nothing's simple anymore. <clears throat> it's very interesting, but it's complicated. <laughs> so <clears throat> voltage goes to zero. And I'll tell you, current tries to go to zero. But as it tries to go to zero, the magnetic field, remember, that exists around that inductor now shrinks or collapses inward on the inductor itself 
So you have relative motion again now. And that magnetic field, as it collapses, induces voltage with the other polarity. So now you have not a buck, but a boost effect. <clears throat> the inductor was bucking. Now it's going to boost. Do you notice um, it's a characteristic of inductors? They oppose change in current. If you try to increase current, the expanding magnetic field around the inductor generates a back EMF or an opposing voltage, <clears throat> which kind of fights you on that. And then if you try to decrease current, the collapsing magnetic field generates a boost. A forward EMF is now what we get. Um, so there was a back EMF. Now there's a forward EMF generated, also known as boost. And it's a real generator happening here. It's relative motion <coughs> between an in, uh, a conductor and a magnetic field. It's all wrapped up in itself. But um, that forward push makes the inductor turn into a little source of its own. It's a little generator now that's going to push current forward. In other words, sustain it. Um, what did we have here? You know, we have our, 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 our voltage source, the square wave, go to zero. So it's not pushing anymore but the collapsing magnetic field around the inductor is pushing and so it sustains current <clears throat> through the resistor uh, for a while for, for a short time because the field's going to be collapsing and eventually go away and then current will go away to zero but that's the inductive reactance um, <clears throat> it fights change in current um, is one way to sort of sum it up um, so th those are, those are, I think that we've mapped out the whole effect and then we can draw it with, with waveforms. <clears throat> Let's see, we've got this open, we've got the short, uh, that's steady state current. That's the steady current. Uh, it looked like an open at first when we tried to initially get current going, uh, then when we try to stop current, um, how would we describe that? Um, uh, it's sort of a boost here. I just use that word again. <clears throat> or some people might say like a kick, you get an, an inductive kick. Um, that can be really dramatic, by the way. Um, we can uh, <coughs> probably do some examples for you, but um, that collapsing magnetic field can happen very quickly, and the speed of that relative motion generates a higher voltage. If you, if you, if you, for example, open up the circuit and force current to go to zero uh, by with an open, it's kind of like popping a balloon. You get really high voltage kick from the inductor um, because <clears throat> the magnetic field collapses um, very rapidly. Then. Uh, and you get a, a high voltage. So uh, you can generate thousands of volts from just a little one and a half volt battery uh, quite easily. Just if you wanted to try a little experiment, um, you have to be careful because it gets dangerous quickly. Uh, capacitors and inductors, remember a capacitor is like filling up a bucket and you can douse all that water at once. So that's a dramatic effect, a very explosive effect. <clears throat> Inductors do sort of the same thing with voltage, um, but they can, uh, you can start current through the inductor and it builds a magnetic field, but then you can kind of pop that magnetic field all at once by just disconnecting the wire and a spark will jump um, thousands of volts. <clears throat> you get a little shocker quite easily out of, a, out of just a piece of wire coiled up. Um, make a coil, put a battery on it. If you hold on to both ends of that coil and disconnect the battery, you'll feel the thousands of volts. Be careful. Um, I, sh I don't know why I'm telling you this. <laughs> that can be dangerous, yeah. Um, so you have to really keep it small, keep things small, but um, the, 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 the kick that comes from an inductor's own magnetic field collapsing around itself can be uh, deadly. <clears throat> okay, um, so let's maybe try to draw this out 
in waveforms that would actually show us exactly what we talked through because <coughs> it's all visible on our scope and that's really what the exercise is then and then if we have time i think we can if it's not too much time we can maybe quickly contrast compare and contrast it with a capacitor or with capacitance um let's see here on the kick okay all right what does it look like well we can do our square wave and then um uh let's put a y x and y axis so all right how do we want to do this all right so let's get our axes on here <clears throat> first thing we could use one channel of our scope to be watching across the 1k resistor and what you'll see is current uh starting at zero but growing and it grows at an exponential rate um so and if that looks familiar it should chapter 16 i believe it is in our textbook if you want all the information on on time constants um <coughs> it turns out uh just like we had an rc time constant there is also an lr time constant it's just uh, a lot of the same concept but everything's opposite if that makes sense we'll see um if you remember that th th this this current that i show for a capacitor that's voltage will increase as the capacitor charges up here current grows as the magnetic field slows down you know it initially is, is, is cutting through the windings rapidly and close and then farther away <clears throat> so it's l divided by r tells you how quickly in seconds how fast current will reach 63 percent of its maximum current here and after five time constants you'd be at about 99 percent of the way there 99.99 whatever so time constants show up again uh, but that's that's good for you to know that inductors they have time constants too but it's not l times r it's l divided by r it tells you how many seconds it'll take to reach 63 percent after another time constant it goes to 63 percent of the remaining distance etc <coughs> so it's current that grows instead of voltage and we can see that with um let's put channel two of our scope across the 1k resistor and you will see current growing in time the other thing you'll see <clears throat> is the voltage with channel one right across the inductor let's look at the voltage of the inductor itself and we said it looks like an open at first well because it bucks this change so if you're here uh, the inductor's here right away as soon as you apply voltage the inductor gets all of it because just like an open gets all of it going back to the dc course theory <clears throat> an open in a series circuit gets all the voltage and the inductor looks essentially like an open or like infinite ohms anyway because the the reverse uh generated voltage uh, uh completely opposes the source voltage and so it gets uh essentially an infinite ohm of impedance it's not resistance it's a different kind of impedance it's coming from a reverse generated voltage <clears throat> And that's what we're going to put all together for you <coughs> very soon is the fact that there's maybe three kinds of impedance to current three things that impede current you know uh resistance is just one of them but the other types of impedances happen maybe from voltage that's generated in reverse and a charging capacitor has sort of that characteristic of an opposing voltage as it charges up it opposes with that charge and then um the inductor also as it generates an opposing voltage so caps and inductors they have their own opposition to current that comes from their in a caps case it's charged voltage and in an inductors case it's induced voltage it's generated voltage <clears throat> so that puts us looking like infinite ohms and getting all the source voltage for the inductor but then as time goes by the inductors uh induced voltage d decreases and that's what allows current to grow and it also and so it's going to have this sort of opposite shape 
Okay, so this is the voltage of the inductor, and we can look at that with channel one. And the voltage across the resistor uh, is here. And remember, voltage across the resistor is essentially current, right? I mean, in fact, it's it's a 1K resistor, so with Ohm's law, that puts us at whatever number shows up for for channel two is actually milliamps, isn't it? So we can you can do that in the analog discovery. You can rename that uh, channel to, to 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 on the left side. You can actually list it as current. <clears throat> so this is a, this is our current waveform here. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, at any moment in time, uh, the two voltages, I mean, when I'm talking the voltage across the inductor, the voltage across the resistor, they are the only things in the circuit. So they will, <coughs> at any moment in time, add together to the source voltage. Now, right now, the source voltage is whatever this peak voltage that we're applying. I think in the analog, I think in the lab, I have three volts. Uh, the analog discovery can only go as high as five volts. So I just wanted to stay within bounds there. So it's probably three volts. And then um, what we've got is any point in time. So if you look, you know, there's no current and the inductor has all the voltage. Well, that's why there's no current, you know, right? Uh, no voltage left for the resistor. But as time goes by, current grows and that means the resistor is getting some voltage, the inductor is losing its voltage, getting less and less. So the inductor's impedance is going down <clears throat> and getting less voltage as it shares voltage with the 1K. Lots of ways you can look at it here. They have the same voltage. They're each uh, getting an equal share of it <clears throat> and so on. But that is a, a point worth mentioning that they're, they're at any point in time, these voltages add to the source voltage so you can use the math function in the analog discovery and um, if you sum channel one and channel two you'll see the square wave that exists um, let's maybe draw that in for you uh, there you know these these will always add to five volts so, so let's maybe put that in <clears throat> okay and then uh, we should do the other half of this right so uh let's um let's say that when the source goes to zero let's see what happens right because that's worth looking at <clears throat> so now at some point that source is going to change our square wave you know that we're using will go to zero volts and you might notice um <clears throat> it makes sense for our square wave we would probably have an idea of what a good pulse width is to use based on the LR time constant. Probably a good time for the pulse width would be, if you want to see the whole thing happen, 5T, right, would be a good idea, right? So whatever inductor you, you're using and whatever resistor you're using to do this little demo circuit, they will. you can calculate a time constant. Remember, 5T lets you see all the way to the 99.99% point. So five time constants would be a good time for a pulse width if you're figuring out what to what what frequency to use to demo inductive reactants <clears throat> in this way. Okay, so then the square wave goes to zero. So what happens? Remember, we're over here now with a collapsing magnetic field and even though the source itself has gone to zero, current is going to be sustained by the collapsing magnetic field generating a push. So let's take a look at that. Current, if it, it will have risen up to here, it's going to stay here as the field collapses and then it'll decay with the decaying magnetic field. So current's going to just look like this. And it, ex it looks exactly like the shark fin of a charging cap, right? Only it's current that's rising and falling in that shark fin shape, right? <clears throat> For capacitors, the cap would charge up. This would be voltage across the cap. And this would be current, right? And now they've changed places. And you'll find that caps and inductors are opposites in every way. Um, which is actually a convenient thing that we'll make use of 
<coughs> in the AC course. <coughs> but for a capacitor, voltage charged and then discharged. And current slowed down. And you remember when the cap discharged current reverses direction, same thing's going to happen here. It's a little harder to see. The voltage of the inductor, let's go back over to our circuit. You remember for the buck, it was generating a back EMF as, as field expanded. But now, it's gener as the field collapses, it generates a forward EMF. So its polarity reverses and that collapsing field generates, it'll be down here actually. This is the point now, as that strong magnetic field collapses, it starts here and decays. So the generated voltage that's pushing current to keep it going even after the source has gone to zero, because remember our source, our source here our source is at zero <clears throat> now and so the voltage of the inductor is here and it it's it's there because of the collapsing magnetic field the magnetic field is 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 collapsing inward and and dissipating so the voltage that's generated by it also dissipates okay cool little picture right makes a good t-shirt logo probably um could start your own t-shirt company i think with some of these uh let's see <clears throat> so this is what'll show up and it tells the whole story uh if you know how to read it you know pictures worth a thousand words but um <clears throat> you kind of have to understand or know what you're looking at so this is exactly what an inductor will do it'll block you with its own induced reverse voltage or back emf or buck and then that relaxes and current can grow. And at some point, if we kept this voltage being applied going, it would just be a steady state current here. And the inductor would not have much opposition at all. Again, it's, uh, the inductor starts with high opposition, infinite ohms and goes to nothing, except it's winding resistance. <clears throat> and then when you try to stop current, the inductor actually own magnetic field collapses inward and keeps current going for this same time and this decays and the decay rate is the same uh, time constant as the as the increasing current it decays at the same rate it'll drop 63 percent of the distance in one time constant <coughs> and voltage will fall back this way too but this is our but our, our this is our boost this is our kick notice how the voltage that's generated here is in opposite polarity. It goes like this. Okay. Cool thing is we can see all of this with our little analog discovery. We can put that square wave, a three volt square wave right on it. And I think all this will show up. Uh, so we'll see if we have success with that. And real quickly, I see, um, I don't want the video getting too long. Let's put up a, a quick little review of our capacitor capacitive circuit you know we're, we used a switch to charge and discharge a cap well that square wave can do the same thing for us so let's quickly sketch that in here um, we're going to use that same square wave and we're going to apply it to uh, uh, a simple circuit with a capacitor in it and we can quickly review this because I want you to be able to see how they are opposites in every way <clears throat> we use our same 1k uh, resistor and so when you first apply three volts to this circuit you remember what that capacitor looks like initially it's empty right you've got an empty cap here so or you know it's not charged there's no charge on its plate so there's lots of room so it actually looks like a short at first even though um it's absolutely the truth <clears throat> that um no current ever flows through the cap. It, it, strictly speaking, this capacitor is an open. There's a plate here and another metal plate here, and they are not connected. So it's absolutely always an open. The reason it looks like a short is there's plenty of room for current to flow onto one plate. There's lots of room for coulombs there and off the other. So as charge comes onto one plate, it, it repels off the other plate but it never flows through. 
<coughs> so it maintains its its physical characteristic of an open, but it looks like a short. AC course is tricky, isn't it? Lots of mind games you have to feel like you're playing. But they're not really games, they're, they're the truth. <laughs> it's just tricky. Uh, lots of tricks. <clears throat> So current flows onto one plate and off the other plate, never through the capacitor. If you cover that up, right, with your thumb here, that's what makes it look like current's flowing through, right? You wouldn't know that a capacitor is even there. But that's because there's plenty of room on the plates. There's no charge there yet, so it's not crowded yet. And so, and there's no voltage there pushing back yet. So initially, it looks like current can just flow like a straight, like a wire here. So it looks like a short. Now, the capacitor capacitor is going to start charging up of course and as it charges up the voltage that develops on these plates is and is in opposition to the source voltage <clears throat> so it is opposing your source and we can jump over let's let's get our waveform going here I think I'll scoot this up a little bit give us a little more room so we can jump back over to do the same waveform that we did for the inductor. Let's see if we can do that. Okay. Uh, what we're talking about is this capacitor is going to charge up. How fast? Well, it depends. It's based on the resistor that we have in the circuit, right? So how large is the capacitor and what resistor are we using to control current? So here's our RC time constant right here. And the RC time constant tells us, um, how much time it'll take for the capacitor to get to 63% of the full voltage. So it's going to be the capacitor's voltage that's doing this, right? Charging up. So this is, this is, uh, um, this is VC, the voltage across the capacitor. <clears throat> and uh, current, let's, well, let's get our, Let's get our source here. Right now, we're talking about the time that the source is high, right? We're applying that three volts. And what did we say about current? It's going to start high, like a short, because those plates are not charged at all. They're, there's lots of room. They're empty. Current starts high, but as the capacitor charges up, its voltage across its own plates opposes the source voltage, pushes back, right? That's its impedance to current. And current's going to drop off. So current starts high and drops low. <clears throat> so this is our voltage across our resistor. And it's our current. Okay, so there we go. All right. You can see right away is how opposites they are, right? Uh, <clears throat> there's our, this is our inductor. Voltage drops while current climbs. Here, uh, current drops. Voltage climbs and current drops. So everything's just the opposite. And let's see what happens. <coughs> Eventually, uh, let's see, the cap reaches full charge, right? And do you remember? It'll charge up to the three volts, right? On its plates. And when that is the case, it now looks like the, the open that it is, right? So it's going to be, um, it's going to look like an open. And notice up here with the inductor, we started out looking like an open because of the back EMF. And then it went to more of a short where it doesn't have any opposition to current. Uh, if the steady state magnetic field is there, it's, it's not relative motion. Um, here's the opposite. We start looking like a short and we go looking like infinite ohms which is pretty easy to see i think because that's exactly what it is physically it is an open so once it's all the way charged up it's an open and then um we'll get to the last part uh which is the discharging uh this is initially this is an initial state sort of an empty thing <clears throat> that's what makes it look like a short um but yeah, the cap will get, the other way you can see it is the cap, of course, it's physically an open, but it also, when it has the three volts here, um, this three volts <clears throat> from the source, uh, right, has this polarity. So they're in opposition to each other and they just cancel each other out. You know, lots of ways to look at it. 
when the source goes to zero, let's see what happens. So the source then will do, you know, we have our square wave that we're using to test this whole thing out and sort of show us all of this in action. <clears throat> so when it goes to zero, what do we have? What we have is we have zero volts here now, and the capacitor though has three volts of charge. Just like the inductor had um, a magnetic field that could now, you know, uh, sustain current. The, the capacitor has an actual voltage on its plates that can sustain current. So essentially the, the inductor's version of discharging is its own magnetic field collapsing back inward on itself. Think of it like a balloon for an inductor. You know, uh, it's a pretty good visual. Um, when you first start, you're blowing up the balloon, and then um, when you try to stop it, the balloon itself, you know, <clears throat> collapses and, and returns that air. <clears throat> and a capacitor does it a little more, I think, easy to understand. It just charges up, and then it'll discharge. And we saw that with we were using a switch instead of a square wave to to change states for it. But um, when the source voltage goes to zero, the capacitor has three volts of charge on its plates that can equalize back the other way now. So current was flowing this way. <clears throat> and now this will go to zero and that allows the capacitor to discharge or equalize back the other way, which just means we've got um, the opposite uh, uh, current's going to flow the opposite direction. <clears throat> and it will start high again current will because you've got the full three volts charge on the capacitor initially which will uh maybe i can sketch this in for you so you can keep track of what i'm talking about current's now going to go this way as the cap discharges because uh the the source goes to zero volts <clears throat> notice the polarity on the everything reverses right the polarity across the resistor which is showing us the current. So current's going to be opposite, but it's going to be that maximum current. Again, it'll start high while the capacitor has the full three volts. And as the capacitor discharges and loses its voltage and discharges down to zero volts, current will follow. So let's, uh, <clears throat> let's show that. I'll scoot this up a little bit here. We said current will start high again. When the source goes to zero, the capacitor still has voltage. So look, current is going to be doing this, starting high, and then, and then going down to zero as the capacitor discharges and loses its voltage. Not a very good line there, <laughs> um, but you get the idea. So, and again, we can compare that with the inductor and we'll see that the cap, cap, cap and inductor um, are very much opposites. Which like I say, will be useful for us. <clears throat> That is the whole picture of how inductors react to changing voltage and how capacitors react to, ch to changing voltage. Inductors maybe buck and boost, capacitors charge and discharge. <clears throat> maybe I can write that in here for you. Uh, let's see, yeah, that's uh, sort of some nice words. First it's gonna charge, then it's gonna discharge. <clears throat> And a cap's gonna look like a short and then an open. Um, where an inductor is gonna look like an open and then a short. So everything you wanna describe about the two, you find yourself saying the opposite things. Yeah. If you give a capacitor more time, then uh, do you see current depletes. If you give an inductor more time, current increases. I'm talking about this time in here. Um, that's something to keep in mind uh, because later on we're going to tie all of this in with the impedance that you get based on uh, frequency. So I'll just throw it out there. Um, what did we think about time here? If you give more time to an inductor, current goes up. So, so more time means maybe more current, which means less impedance, right? Impedance goes down over time. 
So as time goes up, impedance goes down. And time going up, if it's period, means frequency going down. So when frequency goes down, actually we use Z for impedance, okay? <clears throat> and we'll, don't worry, we'll do a whole session on this. But look at that. For an inductor, for an inductor, I don't want to look that make that look like division. Um, you know, uh, lower frequency means lower impedance. Another way to think of that is as frequency gets higher, things are changing faster, and that magnetic field is moving more quickly, and faster moving magnetic fields induce greater voltages. So it's a, there's lots of ways you can look at this whole phenomenon that happens. But that's a big deal. We've never before had components whose opposition to current changes unless you change the component. You know, if you want a 10 ohm resistor, you get a 10 ohm and it'll be 10 ohms no matter what you do in the circuit. It holds on to its 10 ohm characteristics. And then you put a 100 ohm resistor in if you want more impedance, more opposition. But we're going to get into this whole new perspective with the AC course where I can put an, a certain value of, of an inductor in a circuit and its impedance. It'll be a 10 ohm impedance maybe at one frequency but without changing the component it'll be a hundred ohms of impedance at another frequency so frequency actually changes the impedance for inductors and for capacitors too so if it's a capacitor look what we noticed um if you give a capacitor more time uh or in other words frequency go you know lower frequency boy the impedance goes up for capacitors because you're giving them more time to charge. And the more time you give them the charge, the more they look like an open, okay? <clears throat> so time, giving it more time looks like an open, giving it more time for an inductor looks more and more like zero ohms, no impedance. And then you can tie time to frequency, right? <clears throat> so, uh, you know, there's no end to how many things you can try to sort of relate in the AC course, all of them valid. Um, we don't always drill down into this level. At some point we accepted at face value that um, that the impedance or the opposition to current that, that, that comes from inductance and capacitance, uh, we take it more at face value, but, but it's nice to see from the beginning that it's where it comes from, that it's not magic, that, it, that it, there's, there's, there's real, um, uh, easy enough concepts to see. I think it's hard to trace the concepts and hold them all together sometimes all the way to the higher levels of just, you know, what we'll be doing down the road. We don't always trace it all the way back to its roots, but we like to start with this to show you where it all comes from. And then not to worry, I don't think, I think even for myself, I, I struggle sometimes if I'm, if I'm trying to trace it all the way from its beginnings <clears throat> um, and root causes, that can give you a headache after a while. Uh, but we do start moving forward and saying, okay, we will find ways to calculate the impedance of a cap um, and a resistor uh, and an inductor. What will really happen is we've got three types of opposition that are all happening. Resistance contributes opposition to current. Uh, inductance contributes opposition. Capacitance contributes opposition. Um, and we'll find ways to um, uh, calculate those. And just stick with our nice easy math formulas we don't always have to take it all the way back to this uh sort of illustrative uh way of looking at it um and i mean there's either there's one more wrinkle i gotta i mentioned and that is those three types of opposition to current they do all um combine to form total opposition to current known as impedance um <laughs> one other bit of bad news is they don't happen at the exact same time um, which uh, means you can't just simply add them but you you have to um, geometrically add them so I mean one more little piece of bad news there <clears throat> or good news if you um, want to be caught doodling that in the coffee shop another impressive uh, little bit of 
of a look that is. So we'll, we'll get to that, <clears throat> but but we will find ways to combine um, uh, the the um, the opposition uh, presented by resistance, presented by inductance, pre presented by capacitance into a total opposition to current known as impedance, and that impedance. Uh, varies with frequency. That's the last thing to always remember. It, it's not that you have components now that are just static and whatever opposition they offer, that's it. No, the opposition they offer varies with the frequency that you apply, which it's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. It opens up the doors for filters. You can then do voltage dividers with these reactive components where the output of the voltage divider then varies with frequency. So now you have variable voltage that comes from uh, variable frequency. So depending on the frequency, you get a different voltage output. Um, so it's all great stuff that you can do with it. Is it complicated? Yeah, it is getting a little complicated. Uh, we'll, we'll map it out. We'll, we'll get the key is to stay organized. <laughs> so we'll use <clears throat> we'll use some nice uh, uh, you know spreadsheets so that we don't lose track of, any, of, our, of, our, of our calculations. And then you'll see it's not so bad. But, um, but yeah, it's a lot to introduce, I, I admit. Let's see if there's anything else uh, before we leave all this. Um, uh, I really think um, this initial goal um, is to just get get it up on your analog discovery and, and see this picture that's worth a thousand words <clears throat> let me see if there's anything else that we that we're missing um hopefully it works <laughs> hopefully it all plots out for us um the little three volts that we're using and the, the little demo circuit um, we're going to spend most of our time then going forward not subjecting caps and inductors to a step change or this pulse response where we just hit it with the square wave and see how does it react because we're going to change to a sine wave and it's still going to be doing its same thing but voltage is going to be rolling up and rolling down um, so you won't see uh, this type of a picture this is this is i think good to start with to show us the whole buck boost charge discharge that is happening but just to let you know going forward we're going to change then the game to um, a sine wave and the inductor the capacitor they're still going to be reacting to the changing voltage by bucking boosting charging discharging it won't be quite this look um, so we'll have to we'll talk about that too um, all right, let's see. <clears throat> I have maybe, either, I think that's pretty good. <clears throat> um, sometimes I finish this session up with one just example that takes it into the real world. Um, I can do that quickly and then, and then we'll let you go here. Um, just to build on this fact that um, it turns out the capacitors have greater opposition to low frequencies because it's, it's basically more time for the plates to charge up and oppose the voltage that's here's a use for that if i have a little speaker a tweeter that i don't want low frequencies to get to it because it'll blow it out I can put a capacitor right in the series with it. So this is like a simple example of an application. Done. Guess what? Low frequencies are going to have a pretty tough time getting to that tweeter because I put a series capacitor there. High frequencies, no problem. They'll sail right through. There's not much time for that cap to charge up and oppose the, the voltage and have a opposing voltage, which is really the impedance that the cap offers. <clears throat> So it won't have as much impedance to offer to high frequencies. So high frequencies will sail right 
through, kind of onto one plate off the other, of course. And the tweeter, that's the speaker, that's this small little speaker that can handle high frequencies, but not so good with low frequencies. And then in contrast to that, you might have maybe a woofer, you know, which is designed for low frequencies um, and it can handle that power. Uh, you don't really want high frequencies going there maybe because it doesn't do a good job of reproducing them. So it'll maybe muddy those up. So let's block high frequencies. How do you do that? Put an inductor <clears throat> right in series with it. Now for an inductor, high frequencies generate high speed relative motion is one way to think of it. Um, for that magnetic field that's creating the buck and the boost. And so you're going to have a higher back EMF generated for higher frequencies. This, this is one way to look at it. Or you could think of it as we talked about with the time, um, you know, back up here. <clears throat> There's a couple, couple angles to come at it. But I wanted to do the physical real world example to help you sort of where, where once you've accepted or believed these reactances, you don't always have to like go back to to these time constants. You can you can you can just accept it and um, and then you can use it in the real world. It's, it really happens this way. Um, so so here would be uh, inside my speaker cabinet, for example. <clears throat> I could absolutely have my my uh, input terminals, but I'm going to use um, I'm going to use cap to block low frequencies for uh, uh, for the tweeter, right? And I'll use the <clears throat> inductor to block high frequencies for the woofer and pass low frequencies. And I've got myself a little filter. It's a little filter network, actually, a little crossover network, they'd call it. I could even go one step farther and um, improve this. Look, the capacitor is going to block for the tweeter. It's going to, uh, let's see, it's going to block, block lows, pass highs. I can also do one step farther. This would be called a second order. I could put a little shunt path in with using an inductor. And I've even improved that filtering action. Now look what happens. High frequencies sail through easiest through the cap um, and get to the tweeter. Low frequencies are blocked here. They're also shorted out here or shunted. So <clears throat> this would be called a second order filter. I've, I've added a second component to help with this whole uh, frequency selective thing. <clears throat> I could do the same thing with the woofer. Um, I'm blocking highs because remember high frequency means faster moving magnetic fields which means greater opposing voltage generated by the inductor i can also take a capacitor's uh, uh characteristics and use it to shunt provide a shunt path and short out high frequencies <clears throat> and there i have a second order filter so this is a low pass second order low pass filter it's a it's a series shunt design and here's a series shunt design second order uh high pass you get your frequencies are getting through to the tweeter uh low frequencies are getting high frequencies getting through here and and and, and shunted and here low frequencies are getting to the woofer um and again so so just to give you some practical real world uh, example, uh, there's a ton of them though. That's just one of the simplest ones I can do for you real quickly um, to help you see where all this uh, lands in, in as far as usefulness. Of course, it's very useful. Yes, it's a little bit to get your head around all of it, um, <clears throat> but um, in the end, it's, it's, it pays off big time uh, how much you can do with this. Um, and that's just, like I said, that's just one example. Um, and also, like I say, the good news is <clears throat> we'll get comfortable with the fact that, you know, capacitors have high impedance for low frequencies and low impedance for high frequencies. And the opposite's true for inductors. We'll get comfortable with that to the point where um, we don't always have all this imagery in our heads here. I mean, from this opening session, uh, this sort of fades into the background. We kind of we kind of have it as sort of um, 
a nice thing sitting in the background that convinces us that all this is real and then we go forward and, and start start doing stuff with uh, with the actual um, behavior of captain and doctors that we've already proven to ourselves so this is job one prove it to us to prove it to ourselves using the analog discovery i hope we can get these pictures on our analog discovery uh, <clears throat> and um i think we can i don't I, it's tricky square waves are not friendly at all in electronics they're one of the toughest things uh to handle so we'll see how good of a picture we can get for an inductor and we can maybe repeat it for the cap and we'll see how we do with that um that that's one thing in the back of my mind i know that's always a hard I hope we'll see how noisy it is or how clean it is we'll see what we can do all right well we've hit the hour mark so i really want to wrap this up i guess i'll stop there and um in upcoming sessions we will um tackle um putting together the total opposition like i mentioned i'll put it over here in the bottom left corner now we know that you have things like uh, resistance. We've always known that. We kind of knew capacitance a uh, little bit and inductance. <clears throat> and, and we got to put them all together. Um, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to say to ourselves, resistance offers some opposition. We're going to talk about reactance X is reactants we're going to talk about capacitive reactants inductive reactants that's what all this was about to show you how they react to changing voltage and we're going to put all that together these are the types of opposition to current then resistance capacitive reactants which is a, a, a an opposing voltage uh, and inductive reactants which also generates an opposing voltage so these are kind of opposing voltage type oppositions this is good old how easy or difficult is the path type opposition and we're going to wrap them all together the three of them <clears throat> into total impedance z but like we said the bad news is we can't just add them up simply we can't just say r plus xl plus xc xc plus xl but we have to geometrically add them because they don't happen at the same time exactly the same time point in time um, you can kind of see again that happening here a little bit um, they're opposites so the, the voltage that's generated by the capacitor does not happen at the same time as the voltage that's generated by the inductor um, so we'll do that in another session we got to wrap it um, Good luck with the little picture. Try to get this up on your analog discovery um, to see all of this uh, proven out. Okay.